I am glad that you are here for church today. We have, I know, we have a fantastic video for you. Go, Lindsay. Hola, mi amigo. Hola, amigo. Hola, mi amigo. Por favor, uno momento. Ah. Hola, vecino. Uh, te gustera venir uh, conmigo a la iglesia el domingo. Mi iglesia es muy dorito. Dur dorito? Uh, oh, <laughs> der viti do, uh, y se puede transformar tu vida de pecano. Oh, pecado, pecado. <laughs> not, not pecano, but, but, uh, pecano says muy delicioso. See? 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 See, I, See? I don't even See? know. See? I don't even know what you're saying. You speak English? Yes. You're not a Spaniard. Well, I'm a quarter Hispanic, but I don't I don't speak the language. Seriously? Yeah, I never Seriously. I never learned the language. Seriously. What were you saying? Never mind. sure to invite someone to church third weekend third Sunday third Saturday night of September it's back to church weekend it's a good opportunity to invite people that haven't been in a long time uh, so feel free the doors are open and we're ready so bring them on in and let them know about uh, about what Christ has done for you and about uh, how he has affected this place in this body so uh, 
be sure, and, and if you've been watching from home for some time and have thought maybe you'd like to drop in, that would be a good opportunity to come in either Saturday night at 6 o'clock or uh, Sunday morning at 10. You can come and be a part of what we're doing here. Uh, do I have anything else I need to announce? Yard signs. Oh, we have yard signs. We do have yard signs. If you saw the yard signs that you can put in your yard inviting people to this church, but, but you didn't pick one up and you'd like to have one or you'd like to see one, then by all means, we'll get that to you. Uh, just let us know. Other than that, I don't think I have anything to announce. Great. Well, then let's do what we came for, which is not to listen to announcements or watch funny videos as good as they might be. Let us focus on Christ. He is the reason that we're here and the reason that we sing and play and preach and listen and read. And so let's take a minute and put our hearts and minds fully on him. Lord, how we thank you that you have called us into your presence right now today. We thank you that you have made it possible for us to stand in your presence because you have cleansed us. You have have washed us clean and have clothed us in your righteousness and opened the way for us to come before the Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you love us so much that you've adopted us as your children and that you have a place prepared for us for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, that you've enabled us even now to live in holiness, being completely yours, even in this mixed up, messed up world. Lord, we pray that throughout this service, we would keep our heart and mind fully fixed on you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord? Stop the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you tonight, we come with our hands open to receive and to give. We want to be fully surrendered to you in everything, Lord. And we know that that starts so often for us when we surrender to you all that we own here. And we surrender to you in that way by giving to you of our tithes and offerings. We don't do it out of a sense of obligation, Lord, but out of a desire to know you more, to be your disciples and to follow you to be like you. And so, Lord, today as we give, we pray that uh, our hearts would follow you completely and totally. In Jesus' name, amen. It's the song of the redeemed rising from the Atkin plan. song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain the song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire it's every tribe, every tongue every nation a love song born of a grateful choir it's all God's children
worship rise like a river within me thoughts to express are so many wanna bless you god can't be silent i think of the mercies you show me my lips begin overflowing great is your love such gratitude for all that you do jesus to you at the top of my lungs i will sing hallelujah you're the one who saved me the one who gave me this life i live forevermore forevermore at the top of my lungs i will sing hallelujah i'm not ashamed i'll praise your name Let my heart be heard. I need you so. I don't care who knows. From the depths of my soul at the top of my lungs, I will sing hallelujah. You're the one who saved me, the one who gave me this life. moment and pray. Lord, we do thank you that we can come before you in this way. We do love you, Lord. We are um, excited to be your children. We are uh, so pleased that we can call on you as our Father. What incredible love you've lavished on us. 
And we do love you, Lord. You are first in our considerations, first in, in our choices in life. We look to what would please you first, Lord. We don't often do a particularly good job. How we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to forgive us. And when we miss the mark, you have chosen to cover us and to cleanse us. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray that tonight you would be of particular encouragement to us. It seems that, um, well, it seems that we're, we're pretty quickly and pretty easily beat down. Uh, pretty, pretty easily uh, fall into a depression or loneliness or just difficulty as we try to navigate the things of this world. And it has been a difficult at least couple of weeks, if not uh, a couple of years for us. And so tonight we come to you and, and acknowledge that we need your touch. We need your healing touch. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and that you would keep us focused on who you are and not on ourselves and the, the um, difficulties or failings we might have, but that we are, we're your children. I pray that you would draw us to you and encourage us today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, we are in Acts 27. Now, there is, for the particularly stu astute among us, you will notice that there is only one more chapter in the book of Acts. That means that after today, this coming Wednesday, will be either the last or the second to last. I'd really like to say it's going to be the last Wednesday study in the book of Acts, but chances are it's going to take me two weeks. So uh, we've only got a couple. Yes, everybody's either laughing or nodding. We've only got a couple more weeks in the book of Acts. So if you've been enjoying our study in Acts, then really make sure you soak this one up. Acts chapter 27 is where we are. I will read for you the first three verses. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramidium about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. Let's just stop right there and pray. Lord, we have needs, and we are coming to you. Would you fill in us what we lack, Lord? We, uh, we lack wisdom and strength, and we need to hear from you. So, Lord, I pray that you would be our teacher and would teach us tonight. Amen. Next day, we put it at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly. I really like this particular translation. He treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends and receive their care. That's a great, it's just a fantastic verse. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of auto racing. Now, that's not unusual because a lot of things remind me of auto racing. You might know that I'm an auto racing fan. I like all forms of auto racing. I even like a little MotoGP every now and then. But since I'm an American through and through, I have to confess that the most valuable, most important, most honest and true form of auto racing is, of course, NASCAR racing. Because these are 3,300-pound stock cars with a gas pedal and a brake pedal and a clutch pedal, just like the car you might have one time driven. And they're racing these things around tracks at 200 miles an hour, inches away from each other, full of strategy and, and, and just plain passion to try and beat the guy next to him. I really enjoy NASCAR racing. Now, one of the things that always makes NASCAR both frustrating and enjoyable is that any race, no matter where they go, every time, about 10 laps from the end, there's a wreck, continuously. Things are heating up, guys are starting to compete more and more for position. Pretty soon, somebody gets impatient, nudges somebody in a way that they shouldn't. At 200 miles an hour, the wind whips the car around, and there's a big wreck, and it stops the race with 10 laps to go. Now, that's both good and bad, because you see, when it stops the race with 10 laps to go, Everybody from about 15th position on up in the field now has a chance to win. 
oh, before the wreck, maybe only one or two guys are competing to actually win. But now that it's stopped the race, everybody bunches together. It's like it resets the deck. Everybody now has a chance to win. Now, here's the thing with those last 10 laps. They're going to be absolutely crazy. Because now that everybody has a chance to win, all of the competitiveness that you saw that caused the wreck will be everywhere on the track at the exact same time. Those last 10 laps of the race are generally the most intense laps of any auto racing form at any time. Now you'll notice that right before they get into the last 10 laps of the race, all of the drivers kind of take a break. Matter of fact, there's an in-car camera in some of the cars. You can watch the drivers as they go to take a break. Oh, they might come down the pit lane, and, and, and their car might receive a set of tires, but they're going to get a drink of water. They're going to stretch out a little bit. You'll see them pull their gloves on and stretch their fingers out and wiggle around and put their hand out the window and get some fresh air. You'll see them all relax just a bit. And <sighs> but then they get the notice of one to go. That means they're going to make one caution lap and they're back to racing. And when they do, if there's an in-car camera, you watch the guy. He'll reach up and grab these two straps up on his chest. They have these amazing five-point safety harnesses, and they're all held tight by these two straps. He'll reach up and grab those straps, push himself into a seat, and pull those down as tight as he can because things are about to get real. And the chances of making it through the next 10 laps without injury are slim. And so he makes sure that he is as prepared as possible to do the best job that he can. As I thought about this verse, as I thought about this section in Acts, and also as I thought about kind of where we are as the church, I don't just mean Mount Vernon Church of the Nazarene, I mean the church in society, I kind of feel like we're sitting there with one to go. You know, things heated up there. They got a little bit difficult for a while. We heard a lot of reports of difficult things here in the United States and around the world. And then things kind of calmed down just a little bit. And we all kind of relaxed. We all kind of said, glad that's over. But in reality, it's just beginning. And I think that we're at a point as a church, and I don't mean just Mount Vernon Church of the Nazarene, I mean as a church, where it's time for us as a church to reach up and grab those straps and pull them tight because things are about to get real. And I think if we're going to do that, we need to follow the example of Paul who was in a very similar situation. You remember the story of Paul. He desperately wanted to go to Jerusalem. He desperately wanted to share with his family, his nation. He desperately wanted to share the gospel of Christ with them. And even though he was warned that going to Jerusalem would cause great peril, he so wanted to, to tell them the gospel that he showed up there in Jerusalem. And you remember what happened? A riot broke out. He just showed up at the temple and a riot broke out. Uh, soldiers had to come and calm the rioting crowd down. And he stood up and he said, let me address the crowd. And he told them the gospel as clear as could be. And then they rioted again to the point where he was drug off to jail in the barracks there in Jerusalem, in the fortress there in Jerusalem. Then you remember he was taken up to the governor, Felix, and he had to testify before. He was put on trial by the Jews before the governor. And you might remember that the governor didn't find him guilty of anything. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't violated any Roman laws or done anything that he shouldn't have. And so there was no reason to condemn him. But the Jews were so adamant against him that Felix knew if he released Paul, which is what Paul genuinely deserved, then it would cause another riot and, and, and political turmoil. And so Felix was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. Here he has this Roman citizen who has absolute every right to walk out of the jail a free man. But here he has the Jewish leader, some of the most contemptuous people in all of Roman uh, in all of the Roman civilization that want him kept in jail. So Felix kind of tried to play both ends against the middle. He put Paul in Herod's palace in Caesarea. He was still incarcerated. He was still under guard. But it was about the best place you could be to be incarcerated and under guard. And he uh, called for him regularly to have him come and share with Felix the gospel message. But for the Jews, he left him incarcerated. 
And you might remember that after two years, Felix was recalled back to Rome because he wasn't a very good governor. And a new governor by the name of Festus came in. And he tried to deal with this situation as well. He was in the same spot. He inherited a man that had his rights trampled on for two years in a row. But he also inherited the leaders of the Jews who wanted that man killed. And so Festus tried to figure out a middle ground. How could he deal with this? And Paul solved the problem for him. See, not only did Paul want to go to Jerusalem and testify in Jerusalem, Paul was also convinced that God wanted him to go to Rome and testify in Rome. And so after two years of being used as a political pawn, and after two years of having his rights trampled on, Paul employed one of the rights of a Roman citizen. He said to Festus, I appeal to Caesar. Every Roman citizen had a right to uh, request an audience with Caesar if they had been wronged in any way. And he most certainly had been legally wronged. And so he appealed to Caesar, knowing that doing so would get him to Rome. We don't know how much longer, but certainly it was a number of months later when we catch up with these activities at the beginning of Acts chapter 27. Because you see in those days... It wasn't like Rome had a bunch of C-130s lying around and they could just load Paul on that and fly him into Italy. They didn't even have their own transport vessels. In order to get Paul from Caesarea to Rome in Italy, he was going to have to be put in the charge of a soldier who would go and charter a ship and get him there. So a number of months later, when everything was together, the, the, the Bible tells us, Paul was put under the care of a centurion named Julius, who no doubt had some other soldiers there with him. And I'm sure it wasn't just Paul. I'm sure there were a number of other prisoners involved. Matter of fact, we'll read about that in 27 and 28. There were other prisoners involved as well. And those other prisoners that were going to Rome were already condemned. If they were taking prisoners to Rome, most certainly they hadn't all appealed to Caesar. Most of them had been found guilty of whatever it was and had been determined that they would be condemned. There was a regular stream of human traffic into Rome to be used for the games in the Colosseum. Condemned prisoners that would be, you know, quite literally fed to the lions. So here's Paul preparing to go to Rome after two plus years of incarceration. He was not... Uh, particularly physically strong after that period of time. He was getting older. He was pretty worn out. And he was feeling pretty beat down. He was also, we can see, feeling pretty depressed. You can read there at the end of 26 where he's talking to King Agrippa and and he says, oh, I'd like all of you to become Christians. I'd like you all to be just like me. And then he looks down and he says, well, except for these chains. You can see that he was feeling the drag of, of all of these activities. And he's put in the care of Julius to send to Rome. Now, he goes with a couple of friends of his. There's a man named Aristarchus. And and Aristarchus kind of works as his assistant. Matter of fact, we find that Aristarchus follows him all the way to Rome and actually goes to jail with Paul. That's love for you. To assist Paul along the way. And another one of his friends, Luke, is a physician, comes along with him. That's the guy who actually wrote this physical book. Comes along with him on this trip to Rome. They get onto a ship that's not really a seagoing vessel. It's more like a, well, it's more like a ferry boat. It's designed to take goods and people from one city to another up the coast. And that's all. One city at a time. So Julius and the soldiers and Luke and Aristarchus and Paul and all of the other prisoners are packed onto the ship and they're taken from Caesarea to Sidon. And when they get to Sidon, they all have to get off the ship, just like if you take a ferry boat from one place to another, everybody gets off. The cargo on the ship had to be replaced. And it seems like at that point it was rather late in the day and it's most likely that the ship is going to remain in Sidon overnight. And Paul must have been looking pretty down. He must have been looking pretty down. I wonder if Luke, his physician, noticed that he was dragging quite a bit. And Aristarchus probably noticed that Paul didn't really have much of a spring in his step. And Paul might have said as well that he really wasn't enjoying this trip. Maybe Julius noted that Paul wasn't doing too well and realized that Paul was the one man on the vessel that was a Roman citizen and probably should be treated with some extra special care. But whatever the situation, we notice that Julius... Out of kindness to Paul, that word kindness is, is the word we get philanthropy from. Out of a, just a, a care for fellow man, saw that Paul was beat it up and 
out of kindness to Paul, he let him go to his friends to receive their care. That term, receiving their care, is actually a medical term originally. Luke uses it only here, and as a matter of fact, this is the only place in the entire New Testament that this term is used, but it's used all over old Greek literature. It was a a medical term. To receive medical care was the original idea, but you need to understand that by this time, it became kind of stretched in meaning. You know, like where where I might say uh, that you need some help. Well, if I say you need some help, do do you just need help moving something, or do you need help because you broke an arm, or do you need help because you've been slipping mentally. It can mean a lot of different things. In this case, to receive their care was the idea that he had become so emotionally beat down and so spiritually beat down that he was physically beat down. You know how that goes. One of my mentors that taught me a lot in ministry used to say, and this was his opinion, so you're not going to find it in the Bible. Maybe you will. He did. He used to say that people, humans, are triune beings. He said, God's a triune being. He said, people are triune beings. We have body, mind, and spirit. And all three of these work together, and all three of these are interconnected. And when one hurts, they all hurt. And he told us this to talk about the sacrifice of Christ and how God is a triune being. And if part of him hurts, all of him hurts. And I really like that connection. I thought about this as I was thinking about this story. Here's Paul, who has been spiritually beat down. It's very difficult to be a preacher and stand up and tell the gospel message over and over again and have no one respond. And for two years he does this. It's very difficult to be confined in the way he was confined spiritually. And and emotionally, just being incarcerated is, is horrendous emotionally. Taken away from your family and friends and not having physical freedom. And of course, physically, that's incredibly hard on a person. Paul was in need of a healing touch. And Luke says he got that healing touch because Julius, the commander, let him go to his friends to receive their care. Now understand who his friends were. His friends were the church. Paul went to his friends, the church, to receive their care. You know when when Jesus walked on the planet, people traveled for miles just to touch the hem of his robe because they knew if they could touch Christ, they would receive his healing touch. People came to him and said, would you lay your hands on my son or daughter? They're ill. They need your healing touch. And everyone who he touched was healed. Paul now needs a healing touch. He needs that healing touch from Christ. He needs to crawl up and touch the hem of his garment, as it were. He needs to present himself on his knees before Christ and say, would you put your hands on me and heal heal me? You see, Paul had a long, tough journey ahead. And not only was the travel to Italy going to be hard, but when he got there, things were really going to heat up and become even more difficult for him. And he needed that, that encouragement and that respite of a healing touch for, from Christ. And so, he went to church. Because Paul understood that the physical representation of Christ, the body of Christ, was the people of the church. Listen to what he says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. He, Paul says, For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Now you are the body of Christ, And each of you is a part of it. The precedent that Paul lays down here is absolutely fantastic. When we, who know Christ, find ourselves in need of a healing touch, the place that we go is to the body of Christ. You understand, I'm not saying that if you have medical needs, don't go to your doctor. If you have medical needs, go to your doctor, all right? If you have a, if you have a, a, a chemical imbalance and need to take pills for that, then take pills for that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when your spirit is dragging, when your mind is struggling, 
when you need to be set free from whatever it is that's holding you back, whatever uh, addiction or temptation has got its hands on you and is holding you back, when you have become downtrodden and depressed and it begins to affect you in such a way that you know you need a healing touch, then you need to call out for Christ and you need to go looking for Christ and the place that you're going to find him is here in the body of Christ. And that's something that all of us need to acknowledge. All of us need to be willing to understand that we each need this. And not only that, but all of us need to understand that as the body of Christ, we need to be looking for others who need this kind of touch and care. I like what J. Vernon McGee had to say. He said, even the great apostle Paul needed the fellowship and refreshment of Christian brethren. None of us are immune to that. We need the understanding and encouragement of one another. That's the purpose of the body of Christ, to provide the touch of Christ. I think that's why the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, that famous section that all preachers like to talk about here in Hebrews chapter 10, I think that's why the writer said, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's see how when we get together, we can encourage one another to be loving to one another and to perform good deeds, to be Christ-like in our actions. Let's consider how we can do that. Let's think about how we can all get together and, and, and encourage one another to be disciples of Christ, to follow in his footsteps, to reach out and touch one another, as it were, with that touch of Christ. Let's talk about this and figure out how we're going to make this ha happen. Don't give up getting together, the writer says. Don't decide that you can stay together on your own and, and handle it by yourself. Oh, don't do that, he says. Instead, Encourage one another all the more as you see things heating up. As you see things getting difficult, encourage one another all the more. Figure out more ways of getting together and touching one another and being together and being the body of Christ for one another. Oh, don't stay at home and say, I don't feel good today. I'm hurting. I need a healing touch. So I'm going to just stay home and lie on the couch all day because that might be better. Or don't say, oh, I don't know if I can hang out with those people at church because I don't know if I can fake being happy today. No, get together and find ways to encourage one another, the writer says. I've told you the story before. You probably remember it. If you didn't hear it from me, you heard it from somebody. It's one of those very famous preacher analogies that comes out of a couple centuries ago of the United States that I think if you're going to be a preacher, you have to know. It's the story of the small town with the little church that gets the new pastor. And he comes into town and he meets all of the people and he begins preaching there. And he realizes that there's one old guy that has quit coming to church. He doesn't come Sunday morning. He doesn't come Sunday night. He doesn't come to Bible study. He doesn't come to the potluck. He doesn't come to the men's get together. He's just not coming anymore. So one blustery winter day, he puts on his thickest jacket, the pastor does, and he goes out to see this old man out to his farm, knocks on the door, and the old man, the old farmer, he opens the door, and oh, it's nice and warm and toasty in his house. So the old man says, oh, come in, don't let all the hot air out, come in. And he comes in and he shuts the door and he says, now, Parson, listen up. I know what you're here for. You're here to tell me to get back to church. I know, Parson that I haven't been coming, and you're here to tell me to come, and I've got good reasons why I haven't been coming, and I don't want to hear a word about it. And the pastor says, okay, you won't hear a word from me. And he takes off his coat, and the two of them sit down in a couple of chairs in front of the fireplace, and each one grabs a cup of coffee, and they don't really say a thing to each other. They just sit there looking at the fire, drinking coffee, very companionable and very quiet. The pastor reaches over and grabs the tongs that are used to stir the fire. And he reaches into the fire and he grabs a piece of wood that's in flames. Just a small piece of wood. You could hold it in your hands if it wasn't hot and in flames. He grabs this glowing red 
fiery piece of wood, and he picks it up with the tongs, and he moves it out to the edge of the stone hearth, where it's about eight or ten inches away from the rest of the fire, and he just sits it there on the stone hearth and just lets it burn. Oh, the old man's going to tell him he's being silly, but he decides he's going to wait and see what the pastor's doing. He sets it there in front of him and sits back and keeps drinking his coffee. A couple minutes later, that's not in flames anymore. Now it's just a glowing red coal. A couple minutes after that, it's not glowing red anymore. Now it's kind of turning black. And a couple minutes after that, it starts turning gray and just making the place stink with that kind of rich coal smoke that you get out of charcoal. The pastor reaches in with the tongs and picks it up and sets it back in the fire. A couple minutes after that, it starts heating up again. And a couple of minutes after that, it starts turning bright red again. And a couple of minutes after that, it's in flames once more. The pastor looks at his coffee cup and realizes it's empty and thanks him for the cup of coffee and sets it down and stands up and puts his jacket on. And the old man stands up and shakes his hand and says, I hear what you're saying, Parson. I'll be there on Sunday. When we are together, we can be passionate for Christ. We can be on fire for Christ. When we are apart, we grow cold. When we're together, those who come who are cold are heated up when we're together. I really love what John says in the book of 1 John in his very first letter right off the bat, right after his greeting to the church, He says, listen, we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard. We proclaim. John talks about himself and the other leaders. It's the royal we. He says, when I'm telling you about the things of Christ, he says, I'm telling you about stuff that I heard and saw with my own eyes. And I'm telling you about this stuff so that you can have fellowship with us. That word fellowship quite literally means so that we can share one life. I'm telling you about this stuff so that you'll be able to share one life with me and I'll be able to share one life with you, he says. And here's the cool thing. Our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. He says, because I heard and saw these things, I now share one life with Jesus and with God the Father. And if you come with me, then you'll share one life with Jesus and with God the Father as well, do you understand? Do you want to be walking with Christ, doing life with Christ, sharing life with Christ? It's a corporate thing. We do it together. Now, I I understand what you're all thinking. Attendance must be down at church. And so here's pastor up here telling us all to get back to church, especially you who are at home. You're like, oh, here comes the guilt trip. We're supposed to be there, and instead we're sitting at home. Now listen, first of all, yeah, first of all, yeah, you should be here. And I'll tell you why. There are, there. listen, I, I haven't been a pastor that long. But I figured out very quickly that there are three things that people must do to grow spiritually, two of them that have to do with this topic. If you do not do both of these things, you will not grow spiritually. If you do only one of these things, you might see a little bit of spiritual growth. If you do neither of them, you will not grow spiritually. I don't care how big your Bible is. Thing number one, you must each day spend time alone with Christ. Might look different for you than it does for me. Some people have a specific time each day that they get. They have a specific Bible reading plan, maybe devotional materials they go through, a notebook they write in. They take an exact amount of time each day and they spend alone with Christ each day. Some people know, have a totally different way of spending time alone with Christ, but you must get alone away from everybody else. Make it a priority. Personally, I think first thing in the morning is best. Make it a priority to spend some time alone with Christ. You must. You will not grow properly spiritually without it. You'll be like a, like a, like a, a garden plant that's planted in soil and gets plenty of water, but it's wasted soil with no minerals. You'll be trying to grow, but you'll be weak and wimpy. You must spend time alone with Christ. And thing number two, you must spend time with the church. 
the more time you can invest in the church, I am convinced, I've seen it with my own eyes, the more time you can invest in the church and in the things of the church, the faster you'll grow spiritually. If you're coming on Sunday morning, if you're coming on Sunday night, if you're coming to the Bible study, if you're coming to the men's thing and the women's thing and the prayer meetings and all that other kind of stuff, if you couple that with spending time alone with Christ, you will grow. You just will. It's like putting a seed in really good soil And making sure it's got the proper moisture and sunlight, it can't help but grow. You can't shortcut it. You can't say, well, since I'm spending all this time at church, I'm going to quit spending time alone with Christ. It doesn't work. You can't say it the other way around. Well, you know, I like to stay home and watch four or five preachers on TV. That doesn't work. When you couple those things together, you will grow. But that's actually not what I'm talking about today. Well, maybe a little bit. But not entirely. You see, when the world looks at the church, I'd really like them to see something more than a club that gets together on Sundays. I'd really like them to see a group of people who are giving themselves a way to care for one another. A kind of a group of people that they would really like to be involved in because when people come to be with this group of people, they receive the touch of Christ and are healed and strengthened and transformed and made ready for the journey. I'd like people to look into the group of people that is the church and say, oh my gosh, what's going on in there? But even more, I'd like them to see us out and about taking care of one another. You know, if your only contact with the people of the church is on Sunday morning, I think you're really missing out. Listen to what Peter has to say. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you might pray. In other words, be focused. It's not going to get easy. Tighten them buckles down, boys, and, and, and focus. Above all, he says, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love, remember, that's the choice you make to put someone else's needs and interests above your own, to say someone else is more important than me. You can't be offended by someone if you feel like they're more important than you. I get tired of people coming to church and being offended by one another. It's because they're saying I'm more valuable and important than the person who offended me at church. No, that's not how it works. When you give yourself away, love one another deeply. It covers over a multitude of sins. Even if somebody is wrong and and, and making bad choices, if you love them, you're just going to keep loving them into the body. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. That is, serve one another in real and practical ways. That's not simply have them over for dinner, although that's a really good start. That's not simply, well, they don't have a place to sleep tonight, so they can sleep in my place. That's a good start. But offering hospitality is making yourself available to serve their needs, whatever they might be, wherever they might be. And remember, Paul is, uh, Peter's talking here specifically about within the church, within the body. Watch out for one another, he seems to be saying. And if you see that someone has a need, even if it's just that they're tired out, beat up, beat down, or their grass needs mowed, or their gutters need cleaned, or they just need somebody to come hang out with them, or somebody to drive them somewhere or whatever the actual practical need is that they have, well, offer it without grumbling. Oh, I got to go take the old lady out. No. Just say, how I want to help you because you're so valuable to me. Peter says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Whatever it is that God has given you. You're particularly good at cutting firewood. Cut firewood for other people. You particularly good at just sitting and listening? Oh, how people need that. Whatever gift it is that you have received as faithful stewards of God's grace, share it with others, Peter says. You see, it's not just coming to church. The Church of the Nazarene has this uh, handbook called the Rites and Rituals Handbook, written by one of our leaders, Stan Toller, great guy, It's actually a fantastic book. I use it quite a bit. It has proper wording in it for things like funerals and weddings. It's very, very handy. 
outlines of the traditional services of these things, baby dedications, all this kind of stuff. I use it quite a bit. If you find the one in my office, you'll find paper clips in it of various pages that I've needed and stuff that I've written in there. But the very first thing in that book is the right of church membership in the Church of the Nazarene. And the words of it haven't changed since 1911 when they put it together. I copied down some of it for you here. It says, the privileges and blessings that we have in association together in the church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and very precious. There is in it such hallowed fellowship as cannot otherwise be known. There is such helpfulness with brotherly watch, care, and counsel as can only be found in the church. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that just sound like a place you want to be? Doesn't that just sound like something that you want to be? That's what we've been called to be. That's the purpose of the church, to be the body of Christ, reaching out with the healing touch of Christ for all who would come. Now I want you to understand just one more thing about this, and then I'll let you get off the guilt trip of not coming one Sunday, one time, long time ago. I was over in uh, Nampa, Idaho, earlier this week, hanging out with Addie, who's now back at school. And uh, there was no lunch being served in a particular day there at the cafeteria at school. And Addie was hungry, and so we ran down to Wendy's, because Wendy's has the four for four. You can get a Frosty and a burger, and it's pretty cheap, and it's good. So we ran down to Wendy's to get some lunch. Now, just like here in Mount Vernon, everybody in Nampa is hiring. The minimum wage in Nampa is like $8.75 an hour. I saw a place that was hiring a dishwasher for $13 an hour. Whatever they can do to get people to come to work, everybody is hiring. One place that we went to go for lunch one day was closed simply because they didn't have enough staff. But when we got to Wendy's, they had plenty of people. There were plenty of people working at Wendy's. And I made the comment to Addie, why is it do you think that they have so many people working at Wendy's? I mean, I can't imagine that they pay better than 13 bucks an hour. I can't imagine that they pay as well as that place down the street hiring a dishwasher. They probably pay minimum wage. Why is it that you think so many people are working at Wendy's and we figured it out? It was the fringe benefits. First of all, the people were having fun. The people working at Wendy's were kidding one another and laughing as they worked and just having a good time. And you don't see that all that often. And people who work in those kind of environments really want to be able to have a good time. And so they were having a good time. It must be a really fun place to work. Not only that, but we looked on, uh, you know, they have those little job stations and all the Wendy's and we read what they do there. And at Wendy's, they have a really good medical and dental plan. They offer really good paid vacations. All kinds of, of fringe benefits, better than the benefits that, that many of us as professionals get. The reason that people work at Wendy's is for a paycheck. They come to Wendy's because they need to get paid, because they need to be able to pay their bills. But they could work anywhere and pay their bills. When they come to Wendy's, they get these fringe benefits. You know, a little bit like the church. The reason that people come to the church is because they need salvation. They might think that they can get salvation anywhere, but we know that there is salvation under no other name but Christ. Only under the name of Christ. It is only Christ who gave his life for us that we might have life. That's the only way to have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the, the way the one way, no one gets to the Father except through me, he said. You might not like it, but it's just the truth. That's the way it is. If you want salvation, you go to Christ. If you want to be saved out of the death and hell that is this life, you go to Christ. And if you want to be saved from eternal hell, you go to Christ. If you want to experience the best that this life can be, you go to Christ. And if you want to live forever with him in paradise, you go to Christ. There's no other way you go to Christ. But here is what is so attractive to people. When you come to Christ, you not only receive new life. When you come to Christ, you not only receive joy and kindness and goodness and patience and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. When you come to Christ, 
you also receive the body, the fringe benefits of those around you who love you and care for you are encouraging you and holding you together. And that's the kind of church that we need to be. So let's stop and pray. Lord, how we thank you that you have given us the responsibility of being your hands and feet. How we thank you, Lord, that you have given us, the church, the responsibility of reaching out to your world with that healing touch. How we thank you, Lord, that you have given us salvation and that salvation is found in no other name and that we can trust you with our lives now and for eternity. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us in this time, in these days, to be the church that spreads your healing touch. How we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting. 
Thank you, Lord, that you are the defender of the weak, that you don't grow weary. Thank you, Lord, that you have been an encouragement to us. And I pray, O Lord, that we would be an encouragement to one another and that when the world sees your church, O Lord, they would see that healing touch that they so desperately need. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.